Harvard Divinity School. God is Red, 50th Anniversary Symposium. The Impact of God is Red on Theology, October 7th, 2022. Good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to call us to order this morning as we kick off this second and full day of the God is Red 50th Anniversary Symposium. Uh, my name is Joseph Gaughan, and I'm a professor of anthropology and of global health and social medicine here at Harvard University. I'm also the faculty director of the Harvard University Native American Program, and we are so delighted to have collaborated very closely with Professor Ann Brody here at Harvard Divinity School to sponsor this event, and uh, to also pleased to have the support of the Center for the Study of World Religions and the Canada Program at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs here at Harvard. We have a long and fruitful day ahead with four fascinating panels. Each one is separated by break or lunch, so you have time to stretch your legs, get up. So we'll try to end on time, start on time, uh, but with those breaks in between as scheduled. And we'll try to keep things moving along here uh, throughout the day. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to convene this morning uh, the panel on the impact of God is Red on theology. And the structure of these panels is that we've asked our uh, speakers to talk to us for about 30 minutes on the topic at hand. And then um, we have uh, a discussant who will offer perhaps 10 minutes of reflections on what the speaker has said. And so our speaker this morning is Dr. Robert Warrior. Robert Warrior is Hall Distinguished Professor of American Literature and Culture at the University of Kansas and a member citizen of the Osage Nation. He's the author of Tribal Secrets, Recovering American Indian Intellectual Traditions, and The People in the Word, Reading Native Nonfiction and co-author of Like a Hurricane, Indian Movement from Alcatraz to Wounded Knee, American Indian Literary Nationalism, and Reasoning Together, the Native Critics Collective. He's past president of the American Studies Association and in 2010 was elected the Native American and Indigenous Study Association's founding president and is now with Gene O'Brien serving as founding co-editor of NICE's scholarly journal. He holds degrees from Union Theological Seminary, Yale University, and Pepperdine University He's also served as an appointed official in the Osage Nation government and as a member of the committee responsible for maintaining the Osage ceremonial in Lashka dance in the Gray Horse District. Along with his scholarly work, he has worked on numerous film projects. Uh, his academic and journalistic writing has appeared in a wide variety of publications and he's uh, won numerous awards, too many to mention here. I should say that I recall first meeting Robert when we were, I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois uh, where we were organized to try to retire the chief Alinawik mascot. And that was not an easy task to undertake and demoralizing at times. And one of our most demoralizing moments, Robert came to a visit and uh, charged us up a bit with some inspiration. So Robert, it's a pleasure to welcome you today. And we're eager to hear what you have to say. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, really wonderful to be here. I want to thank everybody who uh, played a part uh, in in uh, planning this and inviting me. Um, so I, I wanted to say at the start, I'm, I'm leaving out a bunch of things, which I think everybody will have to do. It was really a marvelous experience going back into this particular archive that I had around the book, which I wrote about when I was in graduate school 30 years ago. And uh, going back into some of those files to see the things that I had found. What I did at the time was, God has read, was a, a really central text to understanding Deloria's theological thought. But there was so much more there. And I, I went into the Burke Library at Union Seminary, which, like the library here at Harvard, the Divinity Library here at Harvard, is you know one of the just rare resources in the world to be able to find everything. And that was really necessary in Vine's work because he wrote in some pretty obscure places. And that was part of what, at the time, I was just happy to be able to get those things. And nobody had written, not nobody, but about four people had written serious articles about Vine's work. And... And he cited a bunch of places, but delving into the work and trying to understand what was there, I was just, you know, grabbing things out of the library, including some of the things I'll talk about today, and drinking them in, you know, and not necessarily saying, why was it there? And I didn't have access to, to an archive that would help me see why they were there. I didn't have Vine's correspondence except what he wrote to me, and, and so, uh, and I didn't, 
I guess I did probably ask him at various times, but he was very reticent to talk about, you know, why did you write for that Methodist mission magazine, right? And he said, I did it because I was doing a favor for a friend, you know, and, 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 and if I would ever bring up what I saw as differences or even inconsistencies between some of the things that he wrote, uh, he didn't like that. You know, I mean, he didn't really like the fact that I was writing about his work, uh, to be to be honest. And it wasn't just because he didn't like what I had to say about it, but I think he just didn't like the idea that somebody was rooting around in his stuff, you know, <laughs> and in his ideas. I mean, they were his ideas, and it wasn't as though he thought they were unassailable. He just didn't like it for various reasons. And, and along with that, I think he he didn't like. I mean, he's he's published uh, that opinion that he doesn't like some of my ideas. So. Um, um, but so it was really wonderful to get back into these things and to see some of them. And, and I, I found about 25 rabbit holes I could have gone down and I, I chose pretty much one, but there are various parts to it. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and start this. I'm going to have to leave out some things even that I wrote um, to get there. So close to the same time God is Red came out in hardcover in 1973, Bindeloria Jr. stated in an essay titled, Nonviolence in American Society, which some of you, I think, saw ahead of, ahead of time uh, that, that I sent. Quote, societies and religions are built at least partially on the supposition that no significant number of people will be stirred from their inertia to accomplish anything. They will not think, they will not question, and most important, they will not object to whatever happens until it directly affects the manner in which they view their own personal survival. End quote. This dim, pessimistic representation of human agency is similar to how Deloria figured human moral weakness across his many books, essays, interviews, and articles. As I was working to contextualize God is Red 50 years after its publication, this essay recaptured my attention as representing a thread in Deloria's work I had not considered before. Nonviolence in American Society is one of several theological essays Deloria published in the few years before and after God is Red came out, and I want to discuss what insights these contemporaneous theological essays might give us into the book we're reconsidering at this gathering. In the introduction to the nonviolence essay, Deloria writes, quote, the bitterness of reflection these days dwells not on what was accomplished, but on what could have been accomplished had men been reasonable, just, or even consistent with themselves, end quote. This and the other section of Nonviolence in American Society I've quoted from speak to some of the themes Deloria refers to in the opening chapters of God is Red, in which he summarizes native politics of the, of the previous decade. In the essay, however, Deloria makes one brief mention of the native world. If you looked at it ahead of time, and, and uh, I don't know if you noticed that or not, but there's one brief allusion to the native world making it a rare instance of Deloria not foregrounding Native issues. I think it's fine that Rode, Vine didn't write about Native issues in this, in this essay, alluded to them once, but it's a real rarity in his work that he ever departed from that script of saying, while I'm here, I'm going to tell you about the thing I'm working on right now, about repatriation, about a political situation. He, he almost never missed the opportunity to do that. I think it was part of his intellectual DNA to say, I'm on the platform and I'm going to tell you something right now that I'm working on that you need to think about. You need to write your senator. You need to, to join us in working on this. So the fact that he doesn't do this in this essay I thought was significant and interesting. At least as intriguing as that is what I see as a significant difference in tone between God is Red and these contemporary theological essays. From the first time I immersed myself in the breadth of Deloria's writing, I marveled at his versatility addressing radically different audiences ad seriatim, all the while maintaining an immense body of correspondence, nearly the entirety of his body of work being composed sheet by sheet on manual and electric, uh, later electric typewriters. In rereading Nonviolence in American Society, however, I saw something I'd missed, not just there, but in other corners of Deloria's writing as well, which was a beautiful lyrical prose style. Uh, here's an example. So, we cannot conceive of nonviolence today without remembering the grandeur of former days. This is 1974. Without remembering the grandeur of former days when our motives were pure, our cause just, and our movement charging with single-minded determination toward a not-so-distant goal. As we recall former days, we should not despair at our lost innocence or degrade our memories of times of crisis and danger. Regardless of how far we appear to be from our original goal, the fact remains 
that we have changed the world in an irreversible manner. And in participating in what has been essentially an act of creation, we have broadened the boundaries of a possible minimum definition of decency, which now needs to find the time to incarnate itself and grow old, familiar, and wear thin until we can rediscover at an even greater depth the absence of a commonly shared realization of our humanity, end quote. I was really struck when I, when I was rereading this to see who wrote that, right? I mean, this isn't really the Vine Deloria that most of us are familiar with. And I was really fascinated in seeing how I missed it the first time through. You know, I was looking for a certain kind of point that Deloria was making. And then I really found this entire essay is built around this sort of really not just deep ideas, which Vine was always writing about, but also writing about them in a really beautifully crafted way, I thought, taking a big risk. And I think that that was maybe why he didn't do it as often, is that it's, a, it's risky to write something like this when you have a reputation as sort of a tough, sharp, uh, uh, and times blunt uh, writer. So in contrast to this, and similarly to Custer died for your sins, we talk, you listen, God is, uh, God is read, has an accessible, sometimes jocular style. The humor in all these books reflects what I remember of Deloria's face-to-face -face expansive sense of humor, which I think was his own version of a very familiar native brand of humor featuring teasing, needling, insult, the lampooning of rivals, and laughing in the face of tragedy. In the accessible style of these books, the humor provided a veneer covering what at times seemed to me also intentionally flippant. And I would suggest sometimes that flippancy goes to the point of seeming cynical. For instance, his comment toward the beginning of God has read that, quote, Indian activists chose, sometimes cleverly and sometimes stupidly, symbols that they believed would convey the importance of their lands and religions to the rest of America, end quote. While certainly a valid way of describing some of the activism that took place at the time comes across to me as overweening. I don't want to pick on this one statement, although it's going to seem like that after another whole paragraph of it. I don't want to pick on it too much. And want to acknowledge that Deloria wore full, full witness to virtually every foolish move Native activists and elected officials made in those years. He earned the right to say that, in other words. <clears throat> Further, he knew nearly everyone who made these foolish moves, and no doubt in plenty of cases tried to dissuade people from their folly on the phone, sitting in a restaurant someplace saying, please don't do this, right? So when he says this, again, he's earned the right to do it. It does, though, exemplify what I'm trying to get at, which is the way it's easy to read this in statements like it as enabling dismissiveness on the part, not just of himself, but also of his readers, who might be better served by analysis that's just as sharp and accurate, which he often does, without giving people such an easy way out of thinking about where American Indian discontent is coming from. And this was one of the big themes of the time, is where is this discontent coming from? How do we respond to it? What can we do to get rid of it? And, uh, and, and I think that, that, that this comment is one that, that allows people to say, yeah, well, it was kind of stupid. Why don't we just kind of say, respond to it as if it's stupid? You know, and here again, I'm not trying to just kind of zero in on one moment and say that, that this is what's wrong with Deloria's thought. It's an interesting thing to think about as we think about the rest of what's going on, though. Because that doesn't seem to be the intention, but it rather derives from the vein of cynicism that I'm suggesting runs through much of Deloria's writing. And as you can see from the quote uh, about nonviolence, this is not the sort of cynicism that sneers at the idea that change can happen and is worth fighting for, but it seems rather to be a case of Deloria having a sense that he's suffering foolish readers, gladly or otherwise, and that he's throwing pearls before swine. And I think this is the kind of cynicism I'm talking about. I'm, I'm spending my time throwing pearls before swine, to use a biblical illusion. <clears throat> a sense of frustration that his target audience will almost certainly miss the point, coupled with a sense of duty that obliges him to keep trying. And again, this is a well-earned right that Deloria has to do this, to think, I'm going to write this, and people will not get it. Because most often, people would read him and not get it. Right? So I think that there's a, there's a way in which this is a, this is a, a well-earned sort of writerly cynicism. I don't think it's a broader sense of cynicism that there's nothing worth trying to do in this particular situation. It's more 
towards his readers. Let me be clear in saying I don't see what I'm calling cynicism on every page, but rather as a recurrent theme. As such, it's present alongside analysis that gains its bite from its fresh truthfulness and what is clearly a genuine concern for the entire planet. My first book, Tribal Secrets, which had been my doctoral dissertation, made extensive use of that form of analysis, these forms of analysis in God is Read, including the incredible section in which he imagines how different the civil rights movement would have been if every book addressing the contemporary conditions of African-American people was outsold by a factor of 10 by books focused on the past. Thus, as Deloria point, this, as Deloria points out, is what had happened to efforts to bring attention to contemporary conditions of American Indian people. As in his own Custer Died for Your Sins, it would get a lot of attention, and people would say, wow, look at all the books Fine is selling, and sell tens of thousands of copies, which is no mean feat, right? Only to have Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, which ends in 1890, come along in its wake and sell hundreds of thousands of copies. That sharp analysis comes from Deloria's engagement with the wild ride of protest politics that was rocking the native world in the early 1970s. Conditions and events on the ground and in the streets would have been difficult to downplay, which is why I think he has to write about them in the beginning of the book. The murder of Raymond Yellow Thunder in the border town of Gordon, Nebraska, and the riots that ensued there in the winter of 1972, the killing of Richard Oakes, who had been the most visible leader of the Alcatraz occupation uh, that summer uh, in 1972, the Trail of Broken Treaties caravan that made its way to D.C. in the fall of 1972, and the election week occupation of the Bureau of Indian Affairs building. These, in some ways, hijack the putative focus of the book. I want to write a theological book, but first I have to tell you all about these things that are going on. And he does this amazing job of tying these things in. But there's this sense in which you've got to take this opportunity to tell people what's going on. I'll say more about the ongoing legacy of this particular style and how to understand this in relation to God is Read, but first we'll look briefly at the theological milieu in which Deloria wrote this book which I think is an important part of understanding why God is Red comes to us in the form that it does, why it would have the cover that I had on the previous slide as opposed to some other cover. So regarding that milieu, I will start by saying that the title is more than a pun on Friedrich Nietzsche's 19th century claim that God is dead which is a comment itself on the status of religious belief under the conditions of post-Enlightenment modernity. And it's worth quoting just a, two more bits of what Nietzsche says after God is dead, which is, quote, God remains dead, and we have killed him. That's the condition of God being dead that, that, that Deloria puns on in the title of God is Read. In taking up these ideas, Deloria addresses a widely discussed crisis of faith that reached a critical point in the 1960s and 1970s in which societies in first world locations like the United States found themselves reaping the whirlwind of Nietzsche's claim. Late modernity having further undermined the conditions of faith and causing religious people to scramble to find relevance, and relevance is the big word here for this particular theological moment, to find relevance in their, for their beliefs. Part of what makes God is Red remarkable in, fact, and remarkable, in fact, is the way Deloria so comfortably and astutely addresses what was a global crisis. There's an audacity to this, in other words, I think, uh, that, that this is part of the intellectual imagination that brings us God is Red, is Deloria seeing, not only seeing himself as being able to address this crisis, but also then saying, and I'm going to write a book about it. Because people weren't looking for a book by find Deloria about this topic, right? Which is in itself, I think, frustrating. People weren't thinking, we need to hear from him now. You know, and because if we hear from Vine, what we need to hear about is those first couple of chapters. He needs to tell us how to think about the native world. He doesn't need to tell us how to think differently about the whole world. So one moment that demonstrates just how much this anxiety over the future of religious faith resonated in the US is the Time Magazine cover from Good Friday in 1966 that asks, is God dead? This may seem like clickbait now, right? This is the sort of thing you click on to say, I don't know, is God dead? I didn't hear, I hadn't heard, when's the funeral? But in a less crowded mediascape, it was a harbinger of a crisis that had not just arrived, but had taken hold. Gabriel Vahanian's 1961, The Death of God, The Culture of Our Post-Christian Era, was one of the earliest books that sought to engage these issues in a way intended to reach beyond the coterie of theologians and clergy. 
Harvard Divinity School's own Harvey Cox was perhaps the most successful person in the U.S. at addressing a non-clerical, non-academic audience in the U.S. with his 1965 book, The Secular City, Secularization and Urbanization in Theological Perspective, which sold over 400,000 copies and which Deloria refers to throughout God is Red, both appreciating its insight while also lampooning what he saw as its excesses. In fact, in many ways, Harvey Cox is the foil in this book for looking for relevance for your theology, for your religious faith, at the expense of your religious faith, is the problem here, right? The anxiety Cox addressed in his early book was not confined to the US. In Canada, Pierre Burton, a journalist, sold 150,000 copies of his book, The Comfortable Pew, a critical look at the church in the new age in 1965, the same year The Secular City came out. Burton's book was commissioned by the Anglican Church of Canada in response to concerns that the church was slipping from its prophetic role. Anglican bishop and theologian J.A.T. Robinson's 1963 book, Honest to God, critiques what Robinson saw as outdated concepts of God and the need for secularization, for the secularization of theological ideas. Robinson's book sold 300,000 copies in the UK and 120,000 copies here in the US a year, two years before the secular city came out. The Christian church, including its various denominations, confessions, and organizational bodies, was not, it's important to say, collapsing in the face of this crisis. Deloria was right, however, in arguing that unresolved tensions from the social gospel era related to the relationship between work to make societies more just and equitable and spirit, on, on the one side, the work that churches were doing to make the world a better place and more just. On the other side of that, there's the anxiety about what happens then in that, in that configuration to spirituality, devotion, and faith. And I think this is a moment where that question caught up with, with Christianity in a very broad way um, around the world. The fact that many theologians and other thinkers were gaining the attention of so many of Christendom's thinking people, however, certainly seems to have had a significant impact. So I think that this is an anxiety of people looking at churches that are by and large still operating fine, you know, but they're just kind of going along and kind of heading towards what people think of as a precipice. You know, the people in the pews are actually feeling too comfortable, as Burton's book would say it. Another example, the Second Vatican Council in the Roman Catholic Church, which took place from 1962 through 1965, addressed many of these same themes. And what was perhaps the most important of the four major documents that came out of that was uh, Gaudium et Spes, the title of the Council's Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, which was written entirely not, not away from the Council and then, and then brought to the Council as the other documents. And, debated and approved. It was actually written at the council itself. It was formulated. This is where we get a lot of the responses to how, do we, how are we asking Catholic people in the pews to now live their lives in the midst of everything going on in the world. So God is dead and the death of God then were shorthand expressions of what many religious leaders and thinkers saw as the unresolved issues of what Christianity could and should be in a tumultuous world. The reforms of Vatican II, including wholesale changes in liturgy, opening the ecumenical door to non-Catholic forms of Christianity, reproachment with other faiths, were part of this broad movement to make Christianity relevant in an increasingly secular world. Uh, Hugh McLeod argues that theological ideas from Paul Tillich and Kierkegaard provided a basis for much of this work, and that an especially influential concept quote was Bonhoeffer's religionless Christianity, which I think relates in many ways to what Suzanne was saying yesterday about the, the critique of the idea of religion. It's not, tell me about your religion. The question is, why are, why are you calling what I'm talking about religion in the first place, right? It's a deeper critique than that. Uh, to, uh, so to, to continue the quote, as popularly understood, this included three main points. An overriding stress on the Christian obligation to build a better world here and now, a non-legalistic approach to ethics and a critical attitude to institutions and formal dogmas. So God is Red was not just a general idea that people felt like God was dead in their lives. How do I make God come alive in my life? The deeper analysis was, where's that coming from? We have these institutions that have become bureaucracies. Uh, we, have, uh, we have people doing good works in the world without seeing them as coming out of their strong sense of they're doing it because 
they, they're trying to express God's love through their good actions. Instead, they're saying, I'm, I'm demonstrating my love for God by doing good for other people, which are really different things. I'm going to skip through some things so we can get uh, to some other things. So this is different talent, tone and style. This is very, I think that Deloria's, uh, God is Red is in the vein of Burton, Robinson, Cox. And it's interestingly not in the vein of things like James Cone uh, uh, in black liberation theology. This is not the Native American version of that. Uh, this is not the Native American response to Gustavo Gutierrez in a book like uh, um, We Drink From Our Own Wells, uh, trying to, uh, to position Native Christianity in a particular place. And there are real specific reasons for that, of course. So Deloria makes a statement that Western man, this is a quote, that Western man cannot find his way in society either by demythologizing his condition, as Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and the social gospel people have attempted it, or remythologized it, as Billy Graham and the fundamentalists have tried to do. And that's an important part of this, too, is seeing that, that, that there is this other clarion call being made for people to come to a stadium and listen to Billy Graham, right? And, and oftentimes in these stadiums where, for instance, the same year as God is Red came out, 100,000 people in South Africa came to hear Billy Graham. And typically in these situations, a, a quarter of the audience would go forward in these altar calls. You know, 25,000 people going forward to say, I need to do something. I need to, to, to find a new way to pray, right? And to see that these things, these things eventually become, and this is part of the prescience, I think, of God is Red, these things become what we now have inherited as, as the rise of the Christian right, right? This is something that happened with, it seemed more, it seemed different back then, I think, but, um, but, but we see how things unfold there. This statement and the analysis that follows is sharp, astute, and both carefully and deeply considered, but I think it's important to say that we can't measure its impact by looking at it alongside the work of Tillich or, uh, or of Camus. That said, I would also argue that God is Red is less of a period piece than the books by Cox, Alvin Toffler, Future Shock, Vance Packer, Charles Reich, The Greening of America, that Deloria discusses and I think relishes being able to talk about in this public forum. He read these things carefully. He knew what people were reading because he was interested. Yet while Deloria in adopting this style participates in the inherent limits of addressing so many emergent and immediate issues of its day, I think it's worth pointing out that the first copy of the book that I bought and read was the second printing of a mass trade paperback edition that came out in 1983. So I think that this is part of why. I mean, I, I want to see the book as being part of this moment in 1973. People are kind of doing a sort of pop theology and doing pop psychology on, on the world around them. And yet, in 1983, the book was in its second printing in this mass, you know, like a novel. It looks like a novel you'd buy at the, you know, not, not, a, not a big one, not a trade, but, you know, it's the paperback. Uh, and that the edition, that, uh, and that I also own a copy, which is the one that has the, what's well, the one that I guess it's in my bag. Uh, Michael and I both had it out last night, uh, of the first paperback edition. And that was in its sixth printing in 1980. So it wasn't as though people didn't notice this book. I kept kind of going around with it, that it was that it was it was working. It wasn't selling kind of stacks of copies at Costco or at Target, right? But it went through six printings. How many of us here went through six printings? You know, some maybe some, right? But most mostly not. So I want to try to move towards uh, towards a, um, and that that's unprecedented for a native author at that moment. So there's a lot of things that are happening that hadn't happened before in the book, and I think it's one of the things I'm trying to reconsider it to think about as you look back on it, you know, when I say that I have a problem with him calling activists stupid, I mean, I, I do that in the context of saying that happens in the midst of this thing that's really an amazing achievement just because you can't, as the author of it, say, well, this will happen next. You know, even though he'd written Custer and had, had sold tons of copies of it as well, although not 100,000 at that moment, it's probably sold at least 100,000 by now, I would think. All right, so I want to talk about a little bit about native theology, and that's the impact where I actually think, so interestingly, that the, that the impact is really important and crucial. 
In 1989, 16 years after the publication of God is Read, Deloria wrote an essay that would later appear in one of the volumes that came out of the meetings of Eatwat, the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians. Eatwat began in the 1970s as, a, as an organizing point for theologians from Latin America, from, um, uh, and that's how they call themselves. They usually don't use the term Latin America, uh, but people from what became Latin American liberation theology, Africa, and Asia. And in that initial meeting, it was one, there was one person from the United States, and it was James Cone, who was representing, representing not just African Americans, but the entire panoply of minoritized people within the United States. Cone and Deloria became uh, really close friends uh, sometime in here in, in uh, Denver, I think it's where it actually happened, and Vine invited, Vine skewered Cone at a, at a, this is how I heard it from both of them, skewered Cone at a thing, needling him from the audience, and Cone didn't know him at all, and he starts asking him questions about how any of this about black theology would relate to Native American people. And, uh, and if, if you've never been on the other side of that sort of you know, questioning um, uh, that the Vine could do, it uh, must have been a thing. And then, of course, Vine did exactly what he would do. He invited him back to his house, and they ate catfish out of Vine's freezer, apparently. You know? And so, um, and that friendship was important to both of them. And Cone was my advisor, and this is part of how I got to know Vine, was through James Cone. And it meant a great deal to both of them. It wasn't just a friendship that went on for a long time. It actually meant something to both of them. They could really, they talked to each other. They were, they were friend friends as opposed to, you know, academic friends. And in 1989, 16 years after God is Read, we see Deloria writing in a letter to Native clergy and other people who might be seminarians like me at that point, uh, theologically inclined natives is the category I'm trying to maybe use on that. Uh, and he's inviting them to come be part of Eatwat because he's still a part of it. He's a dues-paying member of this organization. He's not a Christian, right? He's not a minister. He's not attached to a church. Uh, and he says, I'm not really the person to do this work, which is why I'm looking for somebody else to do it. Quote, as most of you know, I don't have much real sympathy or enthusiasm for helping to spread Christianity any further. And he says this kind of ironically, but also unironically. I'm doing this for you as native clergy, right? But I think this speaks to this moment. 16 years later, there's still not a cadre of, there are native ministers galore, but there's, there's not a group of people who, who, who step into now the post-God is read or the post-1970s breach and start articulating this native theology that Deloria saw. And this is 16 years later. Uh, the... Um, um, so I want to highlight uh, two things really quickly, and this is almost done. First, he demonstrates, and so he writes an essay for Ewok called Coming of the Spirit, and I, I just have the draft version that he sent out with his letter to seminarians and others. And so it shows up in one of Ewok's publications that came out of Orbis Press, um, which was the, the, the press in the U.S. that published a lot of liberation theology books, including Cohn's early work as well. And Deloria has a perspective on liberation theology that comes out in this in addressing, in addressing liberation theologians. Uh, quote, liberation, he says at the end, ultimately must come to mean a condition in which we understand our limitations and act with some cosmically oriented humility, end quote. So what I find especially intriguing here 13 years, 16 years after God is read, is the implicit critique of, of a basic category, liberation. And his contention that liberation requires an understanding of our limits. It's not actually going to free us. It might free us, but it's also going to make us confront our limits. While at the same time, he advocates for humility, which he doesn't say, but I think it's important to him, but I think it's important to other readers for seeing that that's an important virtue both within Christian thought and, and in various Plains traditions as well, including the, the, the Lakota, Dakota traditions, that, that the sense of, of a virtue of humility, and we have this, the Osages have this too, but the sense of, of real humility as opposed to fake humility is really important. That that's a necessity, that humility is a necessity, as if liberation is, as much of anything for Deloria, a process of freeing ourselves from our inflated view of ourselves as humans. He ends the essay with a warning, writing of liberation, quote, means instead of becoming humble about our own position as humans. We lift one set of oppressive structures and continue to believe that we are the one main show and the rest of the cosmos is the sideshow. 
we will only fall back into the abyss and subject ourselves to another kind of poverty and oppression. So secondly, it's worth noting that 16 years after God has read, native theology was nowhere near meeting the challenge that Deloria put in front of it. Uh, George Tink Tinker, whose niece is here, Lena, who's a student here uh, at Harvard, uh, was the first native theologian to be legitimized within seminaries, um, having an actual appointment in a seminary, doing native theology. He was still four years away at this point in 1989 from publishing Missionary Conquest, the first of his many several, many important books that reflect a native Christian theological perspective. Homer Noli's beautifully rendered History of Native Methodism, which not that many people have read, which is really beautifully done, called First White Frost, came out in 1991. And uh, Noli was, uh, worked for John Adams, not the president, but the person in the National Council of Churches back in the 70s. He was the, the emissary to Wounded Knee. He's the one who kind of showed up at the border of Rosebud and, and, and Pine Ridge with the sort of, and helped broker the deal that ended Wounded Knee, working with, with, with um, Hank Adams and others to, to, to achieve that. There are also essays by a range of Native clergy around that time, including Reeves Nawuk's Comanche, uh, uh, Comanche uh, and, and his wife, Claudia, who wasn't a theologian, but Reeves was, a, was an ordained uh, Baptist minister. Rosemary Maxey, a uh, Creek woman, and Tweedy Sombrero, uh, a Navajo woman. Uh, these were still in the future. James Tree, a seminary-trained scholar of Native Christianity, included Deloria's body of work, um, including Deloria's body of work, and he would pull some of these things together in an anthology, of course. Uh, you know, he was still several years from doing that work in 1989, 16 years. All this is 20 years or more after. So, um, so as I conclude, I want to return to Deloria's Nonviolence in American Society, this essay in Catalogate, to say what kind of clues do we get about where it's coming from? Where do we get this beautiful prose? And I think that a lot of that comes from Catalogate not just being a small publication, but a very specific uh, uh, publication, Catalogate actually means be reconciled. That's why I put reconciled in the title of, of, of my presentation today. And this was, this, there's a long history here with the Southern, with a, a fellowship of Southern churchmen, and then it becomes the Association of Southern Churchmen, where there's, there, there's a sense of a line in the sand that gets drawn by a certain set of people from this perspective who say, Whatever else we're doing, we're doing it out of a sense of faith and faithfulness towards the God we say we believe in. If you read God is Red, this is actually something that Deloria would approve of, to say, instead of running away from your own faith and still trying to maintain it at the same time, like you get in certain ways of reading uh, uh, The Secular City uh, or, you know, um, uh, the, 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 the uh, Robinson book, um, that instead of that, when do you get around to actually saying what your faith actually means to you. And um, so the, this idea then of being reconciled actually comes from uh, a scripture that is be reconciled to God. And this is the sense that people have. It's the only time this Greek word, by the way, shows up in, in the New Testament, particular use of it. I mean, reconciled shows up all over the place. But this particular, this particular form of being reconciled, of this, uh, of, of, um, this imperative uh, sense of you need to be reconciled. It says, you're the representative of God on earth, and that's who you're saying you are. If you're doing that, you need to be reconciled to God. You need to reconcile yourself to the fact that you're doing the work that you're doing, that you're occupying the, the, the place in the world that you're occupying. Um, uh, and and it, I think that that has something to do with why Deloria was attracted to the forum, but I also think he was attracted to it by, um, I mean, we can ask ourselves what Vine is doing with his acerbic criticisms of Christianity, doing writing for this journal from the South, which starts in the South, uh, reconciling God and Southern clergy people. I think it has something to do with the other people who are in it, not so much that Vine saw himself as wanting to impress them, but that he had an opportunity to actually have an audience that he didn't have to think that these were pearls going before swine. Uh, and the people who wrote in, in this, here's a long list of some of the people who wrote in Catalogate. Uh, Walker Percy, Walter Lippmann, Daniel Berrigan, Philip Berrigan, Jacques Ellul, 
Christopher Lash, Walter Wink, Vincent Harding, Thomas Merton, Dick Gregory, Gary Wills, uh, and um, uh, Wendell Berry, Harvey Cox, and then a couple of younger voices that came along towards the end of the journal around in 1990, uh, Christopher Morris, who went on to become a theologian at Union, as some of you know, Stanley Hauerwas, who had this really important uh, uh, um, influence on ethics, especially theological ethics. So I'm not suggesting that Deloria focused on the fame and reputation of these writers so much as he wrote in the way he did in his nonviolence essay because he knew he was writing for an audience that was smart enough and sufficiently theologically astute to understand what he was trying to do. When I was first reading across the breadth of Deloria's writing, I wondered if he might at times be arguing in one essay against himself in another essay. That was my working theory at the time, and it might be true. If only to preside and provide himself with a worthy rhetorical opponent, right? <laughs> I now think something more subtle is happening, something similar to this comment about Reinhold Niebuhr's strategy of writing essays as a way of staking out positions that would show him the contours of what he was articulating in his book. This is a recent analysis of Niebuhr's work and how he worked together with John Bennett, who became the editor of Christianity in Crisis. Uh, and that this helps us, Bennett, Bennett said, and then, this, and then this article about Bennett's work about Niebuhr, uh, extends that further, but uh, the Bennett himself, the, this includes some quotes from Bennett and from the, the, the other article it comes from, and I don't want to have to tease them all apart, so I'm just telling you ahead of time, I'm going to quote the article about the Bennett work. It says, we, quote, must move back in, uh, that to, in order to understand Niebuhr's thought, we, quote, must move back and forth between his books, which provide the theological frame for his thought, and his articles and editorials, which show his response to contemporary events. This is true because his writing often leaves us with a delicate balance between op op opposite positions, and it is only in the light of his concrete decisions for action that we can be sure where his emphasis finally lies. These decisions for action involved dialogues with implied audiences, and situations. Moreover, to extend Bennett's insight, this is still the, the, the newer analysis of Bennett's things about Niebuhr, such dialogues are crucial for interpreting not only Niebuhr's writing, but also those of other CNC writers, and they require relating CNC's ideas to its socio-political and institutional context. And this is about the last paragraph here. It strikes me that when we see Deloria reveling as a thinker and writer in the pages of Catalogate, which is what I choose to believe he was doing when he wrote this essay. And there are two more that I'm not talking about, two more of these essays. That we're seeing a writer and thinker of unique capacity exploring his own limits without the intellectual infrastructure that Niebuhr and others had. And I think that's an important part of this. I want to believe that Vine's gift to us in his theological writings from God is read to Catalogate is the knowledge and wisdom that comes from moving ahead and building your own infrastructure where and when you can. You might have to wait a long time to see someone else use what you've built, but I suspect for Vine, as for all the great intellectuals, the most satisfying, most liberating moments came not from someone else's discovery of that infrastructure, but from his own. All right, so I'm going to end there and we can talk more. About Thank you for those stimulating remarks. And we have now the privilege of hearing some reflections from Dr. Michelle Sanchez, who's joining us by Zoom. So you can see her there. Michelle Sanchez is Associate Professor of Theology at Harvard Divinity School. She received her doctorate in the study of religion in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. Her first book, Calvin and the Resignification of the World, Creation, Incarnation, and the Problem of Political Theology was released by Cambridge University Press in 2019. It closely reads Calvin's 1559 Institutes with attention to how its genre and pedagogical strategies shape its doctrinal arguments in a material context and with an eye to embodied activity. <clears throat> it also places the text in conversation with contemporary theorists of religion, ritual, secularization, and political theology. Her next book examines how Christianity became pedagogically reconfigured as a worldview in the 20th century, with special attention to the role of 19th century Calvinist theologians. Her research interests include the Christian movements of reform and complicated legacies of Protestantism. In 2017, she co-hosted a conference at the Divinity School on Christianity, race, and mass incarceration. In 2019, she co-hosted another conference as part of a larger academic project on historicizing secular studies across the disciplines. So for now, I will give the floor to Professor Sanchez, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, everyone can hear me okay? All good, okay. 
I'm not hearing anything to the negative, so I assume so. Yeah, thank you for uh, for allowing me to appear on Zoom. It was a choice of mask or or not mask, which I feel like I often these days have to make this choice between my body or my face. So you're getting my face. I hope it's I hope it's worth something. Um, thank you so much, Professor Warrior, for for those learned and wide ranging remarks. And thanks to everybody and Browdy in particular for inviting me here. I, I feel like I, I am a, a relative outsider to these conversations on Native studies and Native theology, as you just heard from my, my bio. Um, I've spent much more time with the sort of mainstream, recognizable, academic, theological figures. Uh, but I do feel very strongly that theology is a discipline in the in you know broadly speaking the Christian church or the Christian milieu and in the academy cannot continue. <laughs> without submitting itself to to the critique of indigenous studies, native studies, uh, colonial critique, and so forth. So, so I come as uh, somebody who really thinks <laughs> this stuff is important, but somebody who does not have background in it. So I'll, I say that to contextualize um, what I'm able to offer today. And, you know, I think I always enjoy hearing people who are new to, you know, somebody like Calvin, give an impression of Calvin. So I hope there's something in my kind of outsiderness that is worthwhile. Um, so, so I've encountered God as read at various times over my career, but never in a formal way. It was never assigned to me in a course. I never found it as a discussion uh, topic or a kind of even a reference book in like panels or conferences that I've been a part of, even when the topics were on, you know, indigenous critique or liberationist thought. Uh, which is really unfortunate but what that means is i had not spent quality time with god is right until recently so i'm kind of at the opposite end of the pole here i did not read this book a long time ago i read it closely like every single page for the first time a few weeks ago in preparation for this event um so i don't know why maybe it's because i hadn't spent quality time with god is red maybe i just had some kind of mental block but it was not until I saw the preview of Professor Warrior's remarks yesterday that I saw the connection, or I just heard the connection between God is red and God is dead. <laughs> like I, I asked my husband about this last night. I said, "What do you hear when you when you hear the title God is red?" He's like, "God is dead." And I was like, "Okay, so it's just me." <laughs> For okay. me, the reference was much more like having not spent time with the book. I assumed that it was in the sort of genre and the context of James Cone, God is Black, um, kind of liberationist. Theology. So when I read the book, I was surprised to see, as Professor Warrior notes, it is not, it is not the native version of uh, Black liberation theology. Um, and I, I, but I, you know, partly because this was new to me, I, uh, I was really taken by the God is Dead connection, as you know, as has been noted, famously attributed to Nietzsche and taken up by another strand of theology in the 1970s, really trying to take stock of the impact of modernity on Christianity. Uh, so yeah, this was a real aha moment for me uh, because what struck me on my recent close read was precisely what Professor Warrior notes that God is read engages a mode of discourse in which writing is important and not just argument, it's about tone and tonal shifts. Across God is read, Deloria takes on the predominant register of 19th and 20th century Christian theology that really conformed itself to modern system building. And I think you see the outcome of this as, you know, as what uh, Warrior notes, that there's a kind of attempt to continue to fit Christian theology into uh, some sort of framework of modern thinking, modern rationalization. So he takes dogmatic formulations again and again, right across this book, he takes dogmatic formulations and treats them with unsparing clarity, showing us again and again how these claims about God and Jesus and the world of Christianity, the world that's sort of like uh, reperformed in the refining and the rationalization of these dogmatic claims, fails to respond to the history, experiences, and demands of, of Native life. And even more, the life of the land, the life of the planet, of planet dwellers living in the wake of industrialization, colonization, and technologization. So I love that Professor Warrior pays attention to the writing, uh, to Deloria's lyrical capacity which shows up especially, I think, in the final chapter of God is Red, but also in the essay on nonviolence, which I really enjoyed reading. But also this point about the cynicism and the, even the merciless sarcasm, and at times a kind of bold iconoclasm. I think this asks us to consider the question of impact in a much more profound way. One that refuses the rhetoric of modern theology while also recognizing something very deep in the long and broad history of theology. The fact that 
to the extent that theology has survived and reappeared as a mode of speaking and writing, it's because it some forms of it are fundamentally responsive to the connection between life and language, and particularly to the ways that language fails to be accountable to life and needs to be re-inhabited. Impoverished language reveals impoverished life. Yet when impoverished language is so tightly embedded in the material workings of power, of world organization, sometimes the only tactic that creates perspective can be sarcasm, irony, and dark humor. Even simply restating words and phrases in a way that has the potential of displaying their absurdity, as he does so like expertly with so many theological formulations. And of course, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a more capable virtuoso of, that, of this technique than Friedrich Nietzsche, who also famously did not saw himself as suffering fools in his writing. Uh, as Warrior rightly notes, in one of the famous places where Nietzsche refers to the death of God, he follows that by saying, we have killed God. And the we here seems to refer to the subjects of Western modernity for whom rationalization has suffocated the creativeness, capriciousness, and even the violence of the ancient gods, as well as the biblical God. But of course, God is dead takes on several other meanings in Nietzsche's work. God is dead is also a theological statement one that finds its place right at the center of Christianity's story, the belief that with the death of Jesus Christ, God in some way experiences death. One of my professors pointed out to me some years ago that as the son of a Lutheran pastor, Nietzsche would probably have sung the German hymn, O Darkest Woe, written in 1637, in which the second verse reads, O sorrow dread, our God is dead. He paid our great redemption. Jesus' death upon the cross gained for us salvation. The death of God in Christianity signals a moment of salvation that emerges precisely at the height of human guilt, that when God appeared on earth, humans banded together to kill him. This points to a third motif in Nietzsche's writing on the death of God, I think is seen most clearly in Vespo Zarathustra, that God died from being overwhelmed by the fullness of human suffering. God literally could not survive an unblinking encounter with the fullness of human pain and the suffering that we inflict on each other through our resentments. This could not maintain, we could not maintain a God who could survive what we've done. Something more is needed to make this impossible act of affirmation of the world. Professor Warrior notes not just Deloria's attention to writing and the multiple registers through which he writes, he also notes his lifelong conversation with theology and perhaps Lutheran theology in particular, though he was clearly widely read and deeply conversant across the major trends of the 60s and 70s, as we've heard. But one question we may want to ask is why? What's the takeaway? Was it a matter of circumstance that Deloria never quite shook off the discourse that he encountered uh, through seminary and, and these other contacts and friendships? One might well ask the same of Nietzsche, who many might think of as Christianity's fiercest critic, but who never seemed to be able to let the topic go. It's mm -hmm. different in Deloria's case, of course, in many ways, but I suspect his investment in some kind of theology actually points to something more profound. And for me, this really came out in the final chapter of the book where Deloria shifts to talking about Christianity's failings in the context of native life and speaks in clear terms of the calling of that life and especially of the land in which that life is formed and to which it is connected. Theology, I think, can take hold because at its best, at its most powerful, and I'm speaking in broad terms here beyond merely the Christian version of theology. The theological language, theological discourse is powerful because it's a form of language that answers a call, a divine or sacred call that must be fundamentally understood as the call of life and land and existence that exceeds the confines that ordinary conventional language and dominant rational forms can fight to put in place. But as long as a call can be heard, there's a possibility of a response of a mode of enlivened language through which beauty accompanies critical force. If there is a clear impact of God is read on theology or an answer to Deloria's continued engagement with theology, it can be encapsulated in this fundamental posture of answering a call with the disobedient use of language, reaching around the ossified forms of discourse and refusing the ossified language that goes under the name of theology and thus doing the painstaking work of earning its final positive claim that God is read. Thank you. Thank you for that, Professor Sanchez. And now we have about half an hour to uh, engage in some exchange. 
with Professors Warrior and Sanchez. And um, maybe while you're thinking of questions and we get some Zoom uh, queries queued up, um, Robert, do you want to respond to anything? Sure, yeah, I think this, I really appreciate um, your response, uh, Michelle, if I may. Um, sorry, I was really looking forward to, to meeting you. There was actually a comparison yeah. between an essay that Deloria wrote for the Christian Century on the, the theological dimensions of the Indian protest movement in 1974, 1975, around the same time. And, uh, and I read your, your piece from a few years ago on Calvinism and on Calvin uh, at the time, which was really wonderfully done in that same forum in, Christ, in, in, in the Christian century, where you're trying to take these theological ideas, right, to, a, to, a, to the audience that reads the Christian century, which is mostly clergy and things, but also thinking Christians, right? And, and it seemed like you'd, I, I almost, after, after I read that, I thought, I should bring this in, because Michelle would be able to talk, speak to, you know, this, this act, which is one of the different things about theology, right? Theology has a non-academic audience built in. It's a profession which thinks of itself as vocational, and so it becomes different, right? So that the 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 divinity school is a is a, a professional school, teaching people how to be professional ministers. That's the classic definition of it. Plenty of people don't go on to ministry out of divinity schools. Uh, so that that was an interesting part of this to me was to think that there is in fact this audience, and I think that that was a craving maybe for a lot of us who study theology is that this there's an audience out there that actually already should be caring about these ideas. Uh, one of the things you brought up that, that I was going to say that the Episcopal Church, I think, and Anglicanism is so thoroughly, and I agree about the part about Lutheranism that you see, the, that, you, that, that it certainly doesn't have the systematic nature that you would find right in the Reformed tradition and in Calvinism. Um, but I do think that there's, I, I, I kept thinking of this thing that, that, um, uh, that, that Ella, Vine's aunt, Phil's great aunt, said when she was writing about what the Episcopal Church was to, the, the, to her when she grew up and to the people around her. It becomes a, it becomes a, um, a parallel location in which to live a Lakota, Dakota life taking the ways of being Lakota, Dakota, importing them into the church or making them, transforming them by being in the church. And she says that she says at this one point in speaking of Indians and in talking about um, Sioux Episcopalianism, she says uh, it was their very life, the people in the church, right? It was their very life. This is people. So as you think, you know, when you're criticizing, I think this is part of the pain for Vine is that he's criticizing this thing that had been so central to not just who he was, but who his grandfather and great-grandfather and his father, um, you know, had been. And uh, um, so I think that that's, a, that's an important part of all of this. I think too, just on your very first lines about first um, comments about about uh, uh, doctrine and, and and the various ways we can read that into the discourse that the Lord is using. I think that there's this. I think that you're exactly right and put it much better than I was trying to. And I was thinking through it of there being this sense of this Schleier Machian thing of of somehow this particular theological voice has to be addressed to its culture despisers, right? That this is part of this impulse that Deloria is participating in that goes back to the father of systematic theology, right? Of taking these things and systematizing them in a certain way. And that, you know, that, 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 there's, that there's this impulse that almost seems to, like it's necessary to, to be addressing yourself to, 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 that that's part of how you get through this thing is, is, is by doing that, addressing your culture despisers as Schleiermacher did in, in his lectures, right? Yeah, but thanks for your comments. And I also the last thing I was going to say too is I wondered theologically. I was I was uh, thinking. So did did actually did Christianity? I mean, Christianity is is a is a religion about a killed God, as you said, which is really astute. But did Christianity kill God by making God the Word, by making God the Logos, by making God mm -hmm. the 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 by making the notion of God to be this rational thing, right? That this is that this is the logos. Uh, that that this is yeah. actually how you kill God from the start. Yeah, yeah. continue to disembody God. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, no, I think, and if I, if I said uh, more, you know, I was trying to keep my remarks to 10 minutes, I'll just say real quick um, in response that I think in the last 20 years, and maybe especially the last, I mean, like increasingly, uh, theology has really focused on land and contextualization and place. And, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't know enough about like who's citing who to know if this was a direct impact of, of this book, but I certainly think that it's an indirect impact and the fact that somebody was, you know, making this point so acutely in 1973 and showing that like Christianity as constituted publicly, uh, the way that most people understand it and most churches preach it, uh, has, has severed itself from land and location. And there's so many theologians now who are working on like recovering that in a way that, you know, necessarily, you know, even though it's it's rooting itself in in connectivity to materiality and material conditions uh, necessarily gives up a kind of border <laughs> like protection that the Christian theology through its disembodiedness had maintained. Um, I, I It's hard for me not to see that as part of the impact of, of this book on theology. I agree. Fantastic. Well, we'd love to hear questions or comments from those of you in the audience, um, including our Zoom audience. And I also want to note that Professor Ann Browdy, of course, was originally slotted to convene this, and I assume that Ann is on Zoom. So, Ann, if you had a particular comment or question, I'd invite you to uh, have a chance to share that on Zoom as well. Um, so, hands, or should we, uh, please, Dan. Yeah, I, thank you both. It was just marvelous presentation, really informative. Uh, so my question has to do with uh, sort of I think part of what makes uh, I think part of what makes uh, again Dan Wildcat here Haskell Indian Nations University. Thank you for marvelous presentations, very informative, and I, I really appreciated uh, from both of you. You know the God is dead uh, connection to God is red, and I think we've sort of we've been talking. Uh, you both have, have sort of raised this issue, and I want to put it out there very explicitly and, and simplistically. I, I mean, in a sense, what's uh, challenging about God is read. He's clearly using a Western discourse to talk about indigenous religions. It's very deeply situated in this Western discourse, and yet his message is, forget the word, folks. The word is the problem, that really it's experience. Living religions are experience. And I think in there is, is, is something I'd like to hear you both respond to, because at so many points throughout his career, you know, in this book, you know, Metaphysics of Modern Existence, articles he wrote, he points out, you know, the problem with Christianity is all of their miraculous events happened a long time ago. No one has those anymore, you know? And so they've got a dead religion. The native religions are not dead, they're living. And we have very unusual experiences. Now, I, he didn't like the word miraculous. That's a whole different kinds of discussion because miraculous would indicate it stood outside nature, supernatural. No, these weren't supernatural events. These were natural events. So I'd like you to kind of comment about that. You've both spoken about it. He does. No one appreciates the word as carefully as Deloria. His writing is just so meticulous about the words he chooses and how he phrases things. And yet, you know, the message he's trying to say is, Words are always going to fall short. Yeah. There's anyway, a great set of things in there, Dan, and I appreciate yeah. the, the comment. So, I think to your to your last point first, there's something that I just want to say is confounding to me in in Deloria as an intellectual, and to get to the point about experience, that that there were ways in which the the I think what I call Deloria is cynicism, which is not necessarily the best word for it, but the idea that somehow what the, what the task of someone who is an intellectual, who is a writer, that, 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 it's, that it's to a certain extent transactional and a certain sense functional. 
that that writing is a is a function that we engage in that intellectual work is a function that we engage in in order to achieve something else and this is and and I think that there's a there's a way to read a lot of vines especially his attitudes towards taking up issues of of intellectuality or intellectualism in the native world which you say you know gosh is what he said about my work where you're, you're tilting at windmills why are you doing this you know there's no, it's, it's not worth thinking about right there's there's a there's a world in pain and 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 you know and you're and you're further pushing yourself into you know into the basement of the ivory tower where you can't even see anything right and uh and and of course that can be true right but i think that what's so interesting about the way that you brought all that up is to say, but I think that I think that the intellectual is an experience, and I think that his call in God is read to say we need to confront seriously this idea that somehow mediating, which is I think what it comes down to the critique is that that your religious tradition mediates uh, uh, your experience of the holy, of the spirit. And that, that this is the major difference here between what people do within, within uh, uh, traditional native ceremonies is, is to say, I can have an experience of that. I'm not actually having it through the word. I'm not having it through the, 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 the experience of somebody else doing it for me or it having happened in the past and I experience it vicariously. This is a non-vicarious experience I'm having. And I think that that's a that's a, that's the I think that's a major challenge within this of, of, of God is read, of the idea that you have a experience. But this is one of the things that I'd wanted to say. I guess one of the things I hadn't thought of before uh, that that this is part of I think being able to embrace the idea of the intellectual task as being part and parcel of that. That there's an experience of experiencing your own intellectuality, right? Experiencing your own intellect. Mm -hmm as something that's in fact not just this function of your brain, but is something that in fact needs to be worked, worked on and worked through that should be seen as being precious. It's a precious gift along with the rest of what human life is, right? I think that I was like uh, my friend Kate Shanley's notion from the Northern Plains of being able to say, you know, the, the, the center of reason is the heart. That's where, that, that's where rationality is, belongs is in the heart in the blood that's pumping through, not, not in sort of your brain that can be lopped off, right? So, uh, so I think that, that, but I think that your, the, the overall point about experience is really crucial within this to say, if we're not, and I think it goes back to, to Michelle, your point about, about how do you talk about land or how do you talk about the whole of life, right? That somehow, I think that one of the things that can be problematic about how we, use land as a category is that land isn't the only thing out there, right? There are the things out there. I mean, there's the sea, there's the ocean. And so land has become our way of saying we're going to now recast how we think about this through land. It's actually bigger than that, right? It's, it, it, it's the actual, the climate is not the land. And that's one of the things that maybe this is the next step in all of this thinking, right? Is to say, take all the things we've said about how do we relate to the land? To say, maybe it's we're relating to just Everything, including us, and that's the important realization, right? That we're part of all of this. That my form of life can sit here in this, you know, artificial environment, but it doesn't take away from the fact that I am this kind of pile of pile of atoms and and, and bones and blood and right and, and that sort of thing. So, um, but I agree, and that I think that that the hard thing within that then. And this is what I think that Delorey was pointing towards in, in the work to say, this is why I think it was part of the reason why he's still going around and hanging out with these theologians. It's not this sense of devotion to the church. I think he was good at it, but I do think he did have that sense that he knew that world. I think he liked being in it when people were smart. He hated being in that world when it, you know, when it, when it acted in some of the ways that it did. It was really painful, you know, um, uh, at the end of his father's life. You know, the, the Episcopal Church acted like nothing had happened, essentially. And that was the only time I ever talked to Vine about anything that was where he talked to me about something that was painful. He called me, which would be really unusual for him to do because I wasn't on his A-list of people to call about anything. 
I think maybe it's because I was in New York right by 475 Riverside Drive, what they call the God box, you know, maybe I'd walk over there and do something. But to, to really hear the, the, the pain in his voice that his family had spent generations dedicated to the Episcopal Church. And then his, his dad, who was really important in that, they just kind of didn't act like anything had happened, you know. Um, but that sense of experience, I think, is, is exactly, I guess I agree with you. I don't know, Michelle, if you had other yeah, things Michelle. to say on that. Yeah, I'll, uh, thank you for that. I mean, that was, I, I agree with everything, and that was really great to hear. Um, I, I'll, I'll add that, um, I, I think building off of the point that Robert made, um, I, I agree also, I and mean, that the experience is really important here, and part of what I think he's getting at is not like, you know, words bad, experience good. It's like, how are words responding to experience and how do words therefore take on a kind of life? And I think the techniques that like we've both been talking about, uh, the writing techniques um, that are theologically recognizable, but theological, but not recognizable in the in the standard form of 20th century, sort of mostly Protestant, you know, or Christian theology is, you know, something to do with the apophatic tradition, which would say that, you know, you can't make positive statements about God <laughs> and expect them to be true or capable of, of actually pointing to what God is. Uh, so you have to say negative things about God, but then the, you know, and that, that makes sense. But then a lot of, you know, students will think that you can only say negative things about God and there's no place for positive language. And part of the lesson here is that it's a, it's back and forth. Like you have to say positive things in order to get some kind of content and then you have to negate the content and then you have to <laughs> make new positive statements, which is why, I think, I mean, there's two points that I think this helps us at least appreciate some of the texture of God is read. One is that there's different ways of unsaying things or negating things. You can literally put a no or a negation by a statement, or you can use something like, you know, sarcasm or irony, which uses language in a different way that doesn't presume to be like presenting being itself or experience itself through words, but it's, it's literally like undercutting that connection. And then after all this work in the book, I just found it really profound to see him end so the last sentence with a positive theological statement, God is read. You know, it's like, it took all of this like deconstructing and, you know, critical and sarcastic kind of work to say something positive in the end, which is something that invites, you know, a lot more unsaying after that. I see we have a comment here while we get the microphone to you. Do we have anything from Zoom back there, a question or nothing coming in? Great, please, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm Charles Stang. I'm from the Center for the Study of World Religions. I'm sorry I wasn't here last night, but I'm happy to be here today. Um, appreciated the first comment and the responses to it. I want to, like Michelle, I'm new to God is Red. Um, and I was really struck by the connection that's been drawn out in the comments so far with Nietzsche. Um, and like Michelle, <laughs> uh, it wasn't obvious to me at first that uh, that connection. So I'm I'm with you, Michelle. Um, just that so far, these comments have made me think differently about Nietzsche, and um, a question about uh, Deloria. So the, um, the the question I now have about Nietzsche is how important was land to Nietzsche? Um, because in fact, the visitation of Zarathustra came at Lake Silva, Silva Plana, um, and his works were forged on a kind of nomadic um, period of his life where he was traveling um, along the Mediterranean. So where were seas and mountains in Nietzsche's own, um, as a, sort of the forge for Nietzsche's own thought. But I'll leave that aside and ask this question about um, how the pairing of Nietzsche and Deloria bears on Deloria, because in God is Red, as I recall, the only place where Nietzsche is invoked is um, as, a, as the precursor to the, 19, the, the 1960s or 70s, God is dead theology. But then uh, Deloria says um, that this led Nietzsche down a kind of sinister path of uh, philosophy of the will and the Superman. And um, that this um, you know, was taken up by the National Socialists um, and and, that, and uh, I just looked at the passage again, basically saying, if you pursue such a path on the individual level, it will always lead to some kind of sinister racial superiority. And I suppose the question I have for those of you who know Deloria well um, is, 
is there some, does he ever explore the possibility of something like, but not nothing to the name of the, of the overman or the superman, but the pursuit of possibilities of the human that go beyond, well beyond what we are accustomed to understand the human to be, but not on some sort of individualized level that would fall prey to what he thinks Nietzsche fell prey to. So is there a, is there a, is there some kind of dream of the, what you know Nietzsche will say, like the philosopher of the day after tomorrow, like the human that's coming, um, that he thinks is actually consonant with a native view of religion? So the way I, I think about responding to the question, I think I would, I would, the, the, the part you bring up about his discussion of Nietzsche, which seems to me fairly quick, and it doesn't really recognize, I think, I mean, I think it's, I think that I wanted to hear in that a recognition that, especially in, that this was a difference actually between the U.S. and Europe, right, where I think that the, that, that the experience of World War One that brings us then to to I think what what the 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 theology of Karl Barth that becomes so influential everywhere mm -hmm. that it's not really until this moment and especially around Vietnam but also around all of these issues that are so that create so much upheaval in American society that you get the same sort of really deep and fundamental questioning that happened in in Europe that isn't accounted for in that quick kind of thing. You know, the, Nietzsche leads us to national socialism. Kind of, yes, but also not. I mean, it's also, there's also this, this, this history that, that, that unfolds that, that opens people's eyes in a certain way. It made, it made me want to be able to look at what was being taught at Augustana Seminary in, you know, when he went there. Um, and I do think that, that even though the title comes from Nietzsche, I think that a lot of the impulses come from Kierkegaard. I mean, it, I think a different sort of way of grappling with a deeply, in a deeply existential mode. And, and this is one of the things I'd always wanted to be able to say about Deloria's thought was that, that I see him grasping philosophically towards articulating a different kind of existentialism that can become a communal existentialism to say that existentialism isn't in fact in the as in the western european sense this thing where we focus in on the single person in the dark night of the soul and the you know in this in this in in this um, existential crisis but in fact that the existential crisis is shared out among people and that this is allowed through ceremonies and things like this that I would never make these same sort of generalizations that Deloria was comfortable with I mean I'd always be kind of running away from those things um, but he was comfortable doing that and I think that's part of what made him like theology theology does some of those things making these broad claims right but uh, and you do certainly see, I think, much more even than the 19th century figures. I think you do see, clearly, he he spent a lot of time reading Camus and 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 reading the French existentialists of, of, of that time, right? That, that that you see that in the way that he wanted to. He wanted to. Con he he felt confronted by the world around him, and how do we produce meaning in a world that that makes same things seem meaningless. And so I'm not exactly answering your question. I don't think that he ever does. But I do think that you can see, the thing I was going to say about this, and I, I promised in my outline to talk about Velikovsky and the, and the, um, and the um, ancient astronauts that come up into the second edition. And I, I mean, I, 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 I'm not comfortable in saying this is just a rhetorical strategy that he wants to bring these things into the discussion sort of for the shock value of them. Um, because I think that, I mean, I think that there's a lot of proof that, that Vine really did entertain a lot of these ideas and think about them as being serious ways of thinking about the world. And I think there is the part of bringing them in as opposed to leaving them off to the side as sort of these embarrassing things I sort of maybe think might be true. I think he brings them in because he wants to say, do you have a stronger basis for believing what you say about history than I do about what Velikovsky says about it? And I never, I never see him in the way of saying, he's not doctrinaire about wanting to hold on to Velikovsky. You don't see it show up later. 
you know i mean somebody i talked i talked to a co-writer in my second book like a hurricane i wrote with paul chott smith and we we're talking about god is red and he said but you know belikovsky says venus wasn't here five thousand years ago right and we're pretty sure it was you know but still i mean it doesn't mean that i mean belikovsky had a way of thinking about that and there's this whole way of thing and unloading and un unpacking why this is really hard in the end to believe in the same thing with the chariot of the gods sort of hypothesis of the ancient astronauts, right? Uh, and I think that one's more far-fetched. Um, and, and I remember that from the 70s, right? The movies, the Chariots of the Gods movies and things like this. And, um, but I do think that they do play this role in saying, what is it that makes those things as unbelievable as you say they are? Is, is it our... Is it a predisposition just to think that things that we don't haven't thought about can't be true? Because I think that he does turn around, and this is part of this larger thing about maybe your religious faith should be allowing you to realize that if if it's actually a real faith and you actually do believe in the things you believe in, that some of these things might actually happen. There might have been really tall people that we would think of as giants. You know, I mean, certainly. I mean, I, I can remember people the Osage, you would never know it from me, but that that being 6'5 in you know, 1730 was not unusual. Um, as, you know, so if that's like an average height, it's kind of like 6'4, you know, I, I just, I, I, wish, I, I wish that was me. I've always wanted to be taller. <laughs> Maybe that's like ancestral memory coming out, right? Why aren't I taller? But, but you know, so that, but, but see, then again, I'm now engaging in this sort of rationalization. Where could that have come from, right? Could could animals communicate? Did we did we previously know the language of birds and of and of and the animals? Could we talk to them? I mean, I talk to my dog all the time, right? And so maybe I mean maybe it's not maybe there's something besides maybe this is in fact the 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 the, the evidence that that we've killed God is that is that we automatically so often go to say well here's here's why animals can talk because I can talk to my dog. Um, but what if there was something different? And isn't that, isn't that part of how billions of people in the world experience their life every day, is believing that those things happen? You know, I, I mean, I, I, you can talk to people all the time. I think that the, the point Suzanne brought up last night about, about the, the, the latest work that Deloria did, right? And kind of saying, okay, if we can't, it, it, what about this, right? And here's more evidence for this. Here's more. Here's some things that say these things happen. Even, even if you aren't able to embrace it in the same way that Vine does, I think that we see even in our own lifetimes the way that people have to think differently about extraterrestrial life being a possibility that people in 1970, you're crazy. Of course there's no extraterrestrial life. Those aren't, that's a weather balloon. But maybe it's not. And even if that is a weather balloon, it doesn't mean that something 400 years from now coming to visit the earth that's now despoiled and nobody can live on it anymore, you know, to do archaeology on what happened on this planet that destroyed itself, right? But that, that these people coming from somewhere else would say, why didn't these people really believe more about how the, the, the universe could be bigger than them? Right? And I think that that's part of what I see going on in those things. Um, and, and I think that that's even proved, I was just thinking as I was thinking about these, these parts of the work that, that even the, I, I mean, I was thinking of this moment when right after Vine passed away and that part of the, even just, I mean, what is it, the day of the funeral film, I'm trying to bring up these painful memories, but, you know, the, the Rocky Mountain News, right, kind of makes us part of what they say about Vine's legacy is believing in crazy theories, right? As if, as if that's the day to say that. Right, and to say that somehow you're you're going to kind of say discount discount somebody's life by making this very uninformed statement about it. This guy was just a kook, you know, and and the the capacity for for that sort of cruelty, I guess, really that that happens in our society is, I think, part of what Vine was fighting against. And I can tell you, I mean, he really won. And, you know, he really did entertain these ideas. I mean, I, I thought that 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 those things were in there as sort of a way of saying, I'm just do, using this for rhetorical shock value. But you know, he'd say in letters to me things about 
he was thinking about crop circles and you know and and um, cattle mutilations, right? And say, okay, maybe they can be explained by something else, but your theory of what actually happened is harder to believe than the idea that somehow it happened, you know, because somebody because somebody came from space and did it. Um, yeah, I know, but I think they're really. That's an important, these things actually do all link together. And I think that this is part of what I was hoping 30 years ago when I was reading all this, that we would have really specific looks, not just at Deloria, but at all of these intellectual figures. This thing that Deloria himself seemed to resist, you know, taking his thought and thinking about it in the way we would look at Camus or Nietzsche. And, and by and large, I mean, people will cite Deloria, but they don't sit down and do the sort of systematic look at what does it all mean together? How does it hang together? I'm really thankful for this opportunity, you know, uh, to, to see people doing that and to, to, to put the challenge in front of us to say this is it's what we do when you have a major intellectual figure, a thinker, is think about, what, think about what that work means. How does it hang together? No, not just because they deserve our praise and deserve our admiration, but because there might be something we haven't seen yet about that work, uh, something, someplace they were headed, uh, that, that, that's important for, for, for us to consider. We have come to the end of our time, and we'll break in a moment to um, stretch your legs, get some food, um, and then we'll return at 11 a.m. to begin this next panel. Before we do that, let's offer our gratitude to Professors Waria and Sanchez. Thank you for stimulating Thank you, Michelle. Sponsors, Harvard Divinity School, Harvard University Native American Program, Center for the Study of World Religions, the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Copyright 2022, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.